Okay, well, uh, I'm glad we're here uh, getting together talking about art and what it means to the world. It means quite a bit. Without the artists and poets and musicians, this world would be so square that I believe we would be headed in the wrong direction. It's the artists that uh, make us aware of the times and uh, of how we must remain connected to each other. And when we're connected, it is a closed circuit and there's a lot of power running through that and events happen and uh it's not just something on a page because music just on a page needs to be played it needs to be uh, heard by people and this music is so important to us jazz that it does uh represent much more uh than just the titles of the popular songs that that the players play over it means that um, people have something to say individually. Their lives have meaning. Everyone's an individual and has individual differences. And, and when they approach jazz, they can express it, it through that vehicle, jazz. At, it's an art form that, that anybody can uh, have an, an interpretation that's valid as long as you uh, have some good musicianship uh, behind it. And uh, I believe good musicianship is an event itself. People learning how to play jazz need that environment. And so in 1994, I opened up a jazz club, which uh, featured jam, jam sessions all night long till eight in the morning. And uh, a lot of people were exposed to uh, musicianship that others had, and there was a lot of uh, exchange and uh, interaction that way <clears throat> between the musicians. And that's in a, in a way how the legacy of the older musicians is transferred to the younger musicians. And then the younger musicians take that and of course run with it. It's not plagiarizing when you memorize a song, but it's, it's a way, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a, a tried and true method to learn jazz and, and how it swings so hard. The, the pinnacle of jazz was Dizzy Gillespie and Bud Powell and uh, Roy Haynes and uh, and Kenny Clark, you know, learning how to play that rhythm that we call bebop, and now it's everywhere. It's permuted all the music, bebop being, you know, really the high point uh, and, and really the most exciting. I listened to many, many recordings of Sibelius. I'm a big fan of Sam Barber, but when you hear Roy Haynes and Bud Powell and Charlie Parker play, they are playing the, the music that's 200 years ahead of its time. And uh, it's set the high mark. That rhythm is a very special rhythm. Bebop is loved by everybody. It's the music everybody loves best. And they don't realize it. It's everywhere in the music today as well. But uh, it really didn't go any further than what uh, those three great players did. Tony Monk playing with Charlie Parker and... and uh, Miles and you know, and at that time it was uh, Buddy Rich on that recording, and it's so nice to you know work with jazz musicians and lovers of jazz because we're, we're so much on the same page. We we've, we've all come, you know, look back and try to find out where jazz came from. Of course, Louis Armstrong and Billy Holiday and Lester Young and uh, Count Basie and Duke Ellington. You know, all the great players in the past still influence everyone today and uh you just have to look back and, and see where we came from and and see how solid those that music was and those players were in their musicianship and their regard to you know keep it swinging it's all and, and mostly uh rhythm is so important in all the arts of course in dance it's it's the rhythm is important in poetry rhythm is important in prose rhythm is important in our daily lives you know when we when we're feeling our rhythm we're getting things done <clears throat> and, and that's what a jazzy life is wow i did a lot of things today i, I zipped around i did it really jazzy and so it, it's more than just a you know a, a music you know that started in 1850 in new orleans it's a way of life it's it's um something that i i loved you know as soon as i found out about it i got my I knew about jazz from my father, and then when I got into high school, when I was 14, I got my first Charlie Parker record, 
and uh, I realized the, the power that it had. I think I stopped watching TV about then. I haven't, I haven't gone back. I don't need to, you know, watch TV shows when there's that much good music to listen to. And uh, so I was always interested in, in starting things. I started something in San Francisco in the 80s called uh, Deluxe with, with Jay Johnson. And then I came out to New, back to New York. I lived in San Francisco for uh, 13 years and came back to New York in 92 as a school teacher for a while and then realized uh, I went to see my cousin play and it was so very expensive. He was playing with Ahmad Jamal and uh, I couldn't believe you know, what had sort of happened to jazz in the, in the uh, early 90s. It seems that you go to the clubs and everybody on stage is, is, is great and they're great players, but the audience is just full of kind of old people and, and no, no, no young people checking out jazz at that time. And then, uh, you know, through Phil Schaap and the, uh, the book, The Hard Times and the, uh, the Hard Life and the Hard Time, The High Life and the Hard Time to Tell You Over Parker by Ross Russell. And a few things just happened and, and suddenly uh, people became interested in jazz and it, rightfully so. So in uh, 94, I opened up Smalls and it was quite an experiment at the time because it had no liquor license, and so very young people could get in, and it was a very good deal. You can you can stay ten hours, hear about four bands and a jam session, and uh, there was free free drinks and, and free food, and uh, you know the uh, neighborhood tolerated it for a while because soon there were long lines, and um, it got very popular because it's such a good deal and so many great great things happening there. Uh, or the, the older players were there. Frank Hewitt, Tommy Turn team used to see Lou Donaldson all the time, and uh, <clears throat> Billy Kay's was there a lot. Harry Whitaker, all the great players, and then the young people would come in, and and there was places to hang at Smalls. It, uh, it not having a liquor license, we could stay open twenty four hours. We used to go to eight eight o'clock in the morning, and then some. And I was so interested, you know, being a player myself. I played jazz violin, in in and how you know how how you get better when you when you play and you immerse yourself in that lifestyle and uh so many people have said musicians have said that that smalls help them immerse themselves in in jazz where they can just stay there 10 hours and hear so much music and play so much music and then maybe stay you know we, we never locked the doors and there were Rehearsals all day long there. So that were the early Smalls days. It was about a nine and a half year run of that from 94 to uh, 2003. Quite a unique place. And I think that's what sort of solidified uh, my place being, uh, you know, I, I was really uh, not very qualified to, to be a, a bar owner and uh, I'm very fallible in a lot of respects. But my heart was in the right place. All the musicians said that, and they really helped out. They, you know, they really kept it going. And it's it's sort of like this um, sanctuary that you know where where we're at, where we're at where we are at today. Uh, Leah and I, my wife Leah and I, have a, a nonprofit called Gotham Yardbird Sanctuary. And the sense is that if you can find a place and get in there and tell them, you know, we'll we'll play some music for you and uh, try to rearrange the, the room a little bit and make the stage central and have a good piano. It, it becomes a sanctuary for jazz musicians to hang out and play and, and do jam sessions. And then eventually uh, in about a year, uh, except here in Bushwick, I have to say it, it happened in six months that the, that the, the indigenous population starts coming in and uh, enjoying, enjoying watching all the jazz musicians uh, just uh, have a great time and play jazz the way it's supposed to be played with a lot of fun, vigor, and gusto. It's very exciting for me, uh, even at this point, having, you know, started Smalls and it got so popular that the lines were long and there was drinking the lines and a lot of carousing and around uh, the year 2000, uh, so six years into Smalls, uh, the police told me I had to do something. And so I opened up Fat Cat, and that uh, that that took the lines over there because one ticket got you both clubs, 
and uh, Fat Cat, you know, Fat Cat uh, held a lot of people, and that helped out with the lines. And then uh, I guess in 2013, Mesra was open because it, the line started again at Smalls, and Fat Cat was full. So, uh, it's, I mean, in a given night, if there's 400 people in Fat Cat and, and 200 people go through Smalls and another 100 at, uh, at that's 600 people a night at times 30, it's thousands of people uh, being exposed to jazz, maybe for the first time, maybe, maybe uh, if you're living the lifestyle and continuing it, I think it's a good thing. And I don't think it's a hard thing to do. Uh, it doesn't fit into a, a business model that, uh, that you find with restaurants and bars, but uh, there, there is some, there, there is the model of, you know, build it and they will come build the sanctuary. Get a good piano, a house bass, a house set of drums, start jam sessions. And there, there are so many great musicians in New York uh, and young ones that are coming to New York to play jazz and learn about it. Because th th this city and, of course, Paris and St. Petersburg and a few others are really the, the center for jazz uh, as a cultural movement. And I think New York has always been steeped in jazz, uh, especially piano jazz. In this area, I, I know around the turn of the century, there were 200 different piano companies. Everyone had a piano in their house. Of course, they didn't have a TV. Uh, and that really helps uh, to have the musical instruments around. So 1994 to 1993, then Smalls uh, was closed for a minute and came back with a liquor license. And then... Uh, it, it was it's always run by musicians. Spike Wilner runs it now, great musician, and uh, he's doing a great job. Uh, he he's running Smalls and Mesro. Fat Cat is back at, at at it with the same staff at Cellar Dog. And these are the I guess some of the things that I have achieved, uh, but not by any you know special special talent. More just the kind of grinding away at the grindstone uh daily and you you view the uh the jazz club as like a as your child and you have to protect it and it is very fragile you know if too if you make too much noise you can get shut down you, know, you feel like sometimes there are, there are a lot of confines but it, it can happen here because of the new yorkers and uh here in bushwick the uh new yorkers are are all ears uh so in July of this of uh, 2021, we opened up Ornithology, uh, Leah and I, my wife and I, and uh, I had retired from Smalls in, in 2020 or 2000, 2019 actually. And uh, I was just sitting around like an old man going to the uh, spa in the sweat room there and I met a, an accountant and I told him you know I we need you for our nonprofit that we're going to make because we want to still keep keep at it with the jazz and, and uh, Leah and I were sponsoring shows around the city and a show once a week at this address here where I'm talking to you from which which is a club called Ornithology and uh, it's really like the early smalls which is great jam sessions every night musicians hanging out all night it's hard to get anybody to go home and so we've we started this in july of 2021 so it's just a little over six months old and uh i'm so impressed that it's already working out uh really well i'm impressed with the, the listeners that uh how how well they're accepting you know the jazz musicians who are you know, usually have an element of, of extra rhythm in their body and, and, and they get excited about notes and rhythms. And uh, it's a, they're a different type of animal. And sometimes, they, you know, they, they appear as arrogant or rude, but they're really just uh, in the midst of it and they're not always aware of uh, sometimes, you know, the things maybe that they say or aren't always the cordial, pleasant way to behave. But that's a tradition among jazz musicians. They say what's on their mind. So 
Yeah, I guess my philosophy had, was taken from a teacher I had in San Francisco, Dudley Yasuda, and he and he helped us uh, with this saying that that the right person working with the wrong means, the wrong means will work in the right way. So, I, and it, with Smalls, I had no liquor license, and uh, you know the musicians, as I said. You know, they, they knew my heart was in the right place, and I was quite fallible at, at the things I was doing, and they were helping out. So, so the wrong means, which was me, uh, but I was the right person because I had the heart for it, and I made them work in the right way. And, you know, S Smalls was born, and then Fat Cat was born uh, out of Smalls, and then Mesra was born out of Smalls, too. And so uh, the continuation is here. You know, I guess I was told by a number of people, you know, how can you retire uh, from jazz? You never do that. Yeah, and, um, you know, you sort of have a knack for doing these things. And we were sponsoring uh, a show once a week at, at this address, 6 Sadam, it's S-U-Y-D-A-M in Bushwick, uh, Brooklyn, New York. And it was called Bodhigita at the time. And the owner said, okay, yeah, play your jazz here once a week. And then eventually uh, she, said, she said, well, I'll sell you the whole club. And uh, I had to get a couple investors, which, which was my accountant, who talked me into doing this, actually. And uh, another great guy, his name is uh, Ismail, and my accountant is Mohammed. And uh, we put the money together, and they you know, kept their fingers crossed about whether I can continue you know, my good luck with the clubs here in uh, Brooklyn, whether it was you know, too far away from Manhattan. And, uh, you know, things are working out. It, uh, it's really great here every night. And uh, actually, uh, far surpassed any of my, uh, you know, my my uh, time frame for uh, for how, how, how fast this would get going. I thought it would take at least a year. And uh, here at six months, we're sort of crowded every night and having a great time. Here at Ornithology, and that's a good name for a jazz club because it kind of asks the question, you know, the study of birds. Well, you need a bird sanctuary and to really study birds. You make a nice environment and they come. And that's what happened here at Ornithology. We made a nice environment, permissive environment for the musicians. And they're really starting to come and play all night long. And uh, luckily, the community, I guess the jazz listeners community, has responded, and they're here too. We're very, uh, I'm very proud of uh, the people of Bushwick to be able to change, kind of jump ship from a music that they are familiar with, which is uh, some kind of electronic dance music, and yet uh, they're able to recognize right away that the bebop is a wonderful thing to observe. Uh, and experience just like electronic dance music it's all uh, electric in the end because our nervous system is electric so even though the instrument isn't electric in the end it, it is electricity that uh, and th this is the thing about electricity it you need to have that connectivity for the event to occur you can't you can't keep an open circuit if you have just a, a piece of music it, it is it is has potential but it is like an open circuit. It's not. It's not connected. It's not moving. But as soon as you you put the energy into it and, and connect with it and connect also with the listeners that are going to be listening to it, then then you have an event. And uh, you know something happens. Something moves. These these are important things. Not just the, the static picture of what looks pretty, all tied up like a bow. Uh, it's you know you gotta open you gotta tear away the the wrapping and pull off the bow and see what's inside that that box and throw that wrapper away and dig in. So I can keep talking, you know I I I do want everyone to to uh, you know find their own experience uh, with music and and know that. Uh, you know, there are a few bullies out there telling us what to listen to. I would like for everyone to uh, really go by, you know, what they hear and what interests them. 
rather than you know what they're told to listen to by the uh, Hollywood and uh, you know the current fad, the current zeal. You know, because we're not just hollow receptacles for the current fad. You know, we're we're all individuals that uh, we need to be spoken to in a higher level. You know, we don't want to have our senses insulted by very mediocre popular music. I I, I, I wear earplugs most of the time when I, when I hear that because I don't I don't want to be influenced by that. I, I, I always want to hear in my head Louis Armstrong. I want to hear in my head. Count Basie swinging, you know. So I, I try not to tune in to uh, things that aren't swinging. You know, there's definitely some hip hop that's swinging. Uh, I have to be schooled in that. That's true. You know, it's just like it's just like you know when you have books, you 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 buy a book, you put it up on the shelf, and you realize that that book, if you devote to that energy, that book could take, you know, years maybe a whole lifetime and so you know you, you buy the book you put it up there you say you know i'm going to get to that and that's the way it is you know with some of the music coming out today i i, I will get around to it but i, I still have, i'm still still reading the classics and try to understand them yeah well i think it's important you know to shed all of the uh the categories that you're put into you know whether you're considered um, a person you know that can only work in the corporate world you know a lot of, mostly those people let their hair down after work and kick back and they they want to they want to experience you know get into the arts you know it, it is a lofty endeavor and i can see you know it doesn't have the practicism you know that other occupations have but it, it still can be explored you can you can have a day job and then at night you know check it out check out the, the great sounds of charlie parker uh here in ornithology everyone's been playing that that song but and uh everyone can really swing that song it's one of the swinging the songs that's why we named the club ornithology we do hope you can come out here to bushwick it's uh it's not hard to find it's off the uh m or j train at the Myrtle Broadway station and just a block away and uh, music usually starts here around 6 30 and goes till about uh, well, we went to a good three o'clock last night so um, sometimes I get tired but I'm um, am having a birthday party this Friday I'll be 65 and uh, still feel really young I don't look too young but uh, I run around like a little kid most of the time, you know, thinking about Bebop. Bebop keeps you young. I mean, look at Roy Haynes. Look at all the, the, the great musicians that lived 200 years old playing jazz. Yeah, the music kept them alive, I'm sure of that. I've seen it myself. Yeah, so... I, th I think uh, people like it here. You know, there's no cover charge. We fill the club every night. And I hear people all the time say, oh, this is the reason why I, I love New York. This is, the this is the reason why I come. I came to New York, you know, to come here and hear live music like this. And, uh, of course, there are other clubs uh, that, that present live music like that. So, you know, Spike Woman with Smalls and Mesro and and I know Ehud to share his booking with Cellar Dog. And of course, there are other clubs like the Vanguard and the Blue Note and the 55 Bar. And uh, I think jazz is definitely in a renaissance uh, in the here in the millennium, the new millennium in the 2020s. Yeah, I never thought that, uh, I always thought Smalls would be around. For 60 years and now it's 30 so uh i mean the vanguard's been around that long yeah jazz is here to stay everybody really loves bebop best it's just the you know it's just a great rhythm a great great rhythm that invigorates everybody and you know it's a luminary for thought you know especially 
when um, there needs to be things said about uh, the current current events. And you know, jazz, the jazz uh, world has its own set of current events, and uh, we're always recognizing the uh, great players when they have birthdays. Uh, the, the deceased players with their birthdays. KCR does a great, great uh, radio show every, for all the players: Billy Holiday, Lester Young, Charlie Parker, and and, uh, and Bach. You know, they, they do that at Christmas time. And um, I think I think jazz is is you know has has elevated itself to a music that's not just popular, but ha has themes in it uh, that it, that are express the great themes uh, in life, and that uh, you know each individual is, is on a journey, and you you need that even though we're all going like to to the ocean, we need the banks to guide. To guide to guide the river and the banks you know will guide you to different places and you should you have to select your banks jazz the banks that jazz presents will guide your river and uh, take you on a journey uh, which which will be exciting and eye-opening and rewarding and uh, just a jubilation and then you know we will end up in the ocean but uh, you know, you have to stop and smell the roses. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the great uh, the poet talked about his horse would stop and smell the roses. So at least we can do the same thing. Yeah, stop and smell the roses. And it's the the roses that I'm talking about are, is live jazz. Live jazz is like like an incredible rose that unfolds and and gives you um, you know a, makes you pause and say, "Wow, did you smell that? Did you check out how that beautiful that rose is?" You know, you got it. You got to uh, sometimes pause, put yourself on pause, and just uh, really be receptive. You know, I, the whole thing about playing jazz is that mo most jazz players first start as great listeners. If you listen to jazz for five years straight, just listen. Don't even think about playing it. Then when you go to play it, it's live. It's, it's right there. It's like an input and output. The more you put in, the greater your output will be. So uh, I encourage everyone to, to take a lot of input uh, uh, and take in a lot of jazz. You know, go back and listen to the Kenny Clark records, Roy Haynes records, Billy Holiday, Les Young, and of course Louis Armstrong records, and uh, take take it back in, take it in again, maybe maybe revisit it, so so that you keep your life swinging. Yeah, I don't see any comments, so you know, as I said, I'm not anybody special. Anybody can do this. I've never done it. Uh, on any kind of large budget, yeah, always rented pianos. But you can rent, you know, a Steinway. You can rent a, a Beckstein like we have here, and um, provide a sanctuary for the musicians, and they'll come. I encourage uh, other bars to try this. You make a nice stage, make some nice lighting, get a good set of drums, get a house bass, open up a jazz club. The more the merrier. I hope, uh, I hope someone will take that message and say, oh, this, you know, actually in the past there were some jazz clubs that popped up and, uh, because they, they took them that message. And they said, well, like this guy can do it. He doesn't know anything. And I don't. Uh, then, then I can surely do it. And uh, yeah, it does work for a while. I know a few people who uh, you have to stick with it, though. You, have to, you know, you have to put in a few hours, not expect a lot of pay. Luckily now, I'm 
I'm getting my social security check. And uh, I can really devote my time to ornithology. And if you come by here, uh, you'll see me busting the tables and doing the dishes. And I play DJ. In fact, tonight, Monday night, is my uh, night where I get a chance to perform. I host an open mic and I, I read some prose and poetry and play, play music. I, I play violin and guitar and sing. And uh, it's quite a popular open mic. And um, we do allow, uh, you know, jazzy singer-songwriter stuff to happen. You know, Bob Dylan needs, is a, definitely a force to be reckoned with. And we can do anything close to Bob Dylan. Uh, I'll take that. Wow. You know, I'll take that. Phil, Phil Oaks, I'll take that. If you can sing like Dick Haynes, I'll take that. Doesn't that need to be St. Frank's Sinatra? Yeah. So give it to me, and uh, we'll, we'll give you a platform here at Ornithology, our little jazz club that Lee and Mitchell started here in Bushwick. Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York, where... It's like the Latin quarters because the rents are a little bit lower and a lot of students are here, musicians are here. We open the doors up and they pile in. It's like a bus, happy bus, going to the land of Ubladi. Hmm, what questions do you have for me? As I said, you know, I, my experience prior to jazz prior to 1994 was I was a school teacher, I was a nurse, uh, I was in the military as a medic. Nothing special. I drove a taxi. Um, yeah, just to, you know, I want to encourage everybody, you know, you have the time. You, you know, people say, oh, I don't have the time. You do have the time. Yeah. Time time is the only thing you do have that, that you are in control of. You know? When it, come, when it comes to space, you know, you're not in control of that. You have to pay rent for a space. You have to pay a cover charge to get into a space. You have to rent the rental space. You have to, you know, space is, is, is a closed no to most people unless you ha unless you pay for it but time you have the time you have the time to look into jazz and uh make it a part of your life it doesn't take more than 30 minutes a day to really uh to study it and click in i think it's a, a, as important as yoga or jogging you know, being able to get out, get out to the the clubs, the ones with the no cover charge, ornithology, or go to the ones with the cover charge, Smalls, Birdland, Vanguard. You know, it couldn't hurt. You got to spend your money somehow. That's what makes the connectivity, the event, happen. You know, numbers in a bank is, is like the open circuit. It doesn't There's no energy running through it. You've got to make the connection. Close the circuit. Make events happen. When you go to an event at a jazz club and your mind is blown away, that's an event that you can hang something on, a memory on, for the rest of your life. I sure remember the, you know, the first time I saw a jazz band. First time I saw Sonny Stitt. First time I saw Ella Fitzgerald and Joe Pass. Sure, I remember all that. Hmm. And then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a, a rough lifestyle. It doesn't have to be a lot of drugs and drinking. Not at all. It could be a healthy lifestyle. A lot of the players... These days, uh, are just drinking water. Yeah, trying to keep, trying to know, trying to keep it that they know 
that the source of the music is really from themselves. It's not from a drug or from alcohol or some kind of gimmick that they need to, to take or do. No, the jazz comes deep from within yourself. And you have to you have to kind of go down there and wrench it out. But that's okay. It feels good. It feels good to do that. That's why the players play, because it, it's a good feeling. It pull pull something out of you that you know you know is there because you've inherited it, but you haven't been able to touch it until the until that point when you're playing music you've never played before because you're exploring a certain method uh, and you're playing and you're uh, improvising and you say wow I surprised myself I never knew I could had that I never knew I could pull that out of me and it's like pulling out a historic dinosaur bone out of your body and saying wow now I know my roots now I know who I am Yeah, I don't even know what time it is. Anybody know? What time it is? Um, I haven't had a phone for a, lot, a while. It's interesting not having a phone. You don't know what time it is or what day it is. There are no more calendars or clocks anywhere. So, oh, here we are, live, thirty-six minutes. Oh, I must be done. Oh, I don't know. You're in the show. Everyone can see and hear you. Okay. Nobody has any questions. No comments. Hmm. Well, I don't. I don't need to be taken seriously. Definitely not something I want. I actually want to stay behind the scenes. And uh, yeah, I'll help anybody start a jazz club. You know, I don't want to be a smart aleck or anything, but I have a certain neck. I know how it should look and, what, and how you should treat the musicians like, like they're special. And they are. Okay. Am I on for a full hour? Can anybody tell me that? Hmm. All right. Well... I mean, even as a youngster, I grew up in Freehold, and uh, my dad had, had chicken farm, and we had lots of barns because they weren't full, filled with chickens, so we changed them into uh, big jam rehearsal studios, and we would have two rock bands going on at once, often Bruce Springsteen's band, and my brother's band was like a Grateful Dead band, and... Um, I was a little too young to be uh, playing. I was playing at the time, but they they had me in charge of a light show. The light show was important back then. I would put the globs of colored fluid on a big lens and project that on the wall while the uh, rock was going in a god of the vita, stuff like that. Steppenwolf and uh, great for that. Some of our, you know, we all, most of us, you know, as children, start off with rock and roll. It's a simpler form of jazz. And uh, good. Do I know how many minutes I'm supposed to be on here? So, what time is it? <laughs> so why am I still talking? It's, it keeps saying you're in the chat show. Everyone can see and hear you. <laughs> 